Hello everyone and welcome to another In Conservation With. As you can see, I'm not David, uh, I'm in fact Maya. My name is Maya Bambrick and I'm an 18 year old birder, wildlife photographer and all round nature lover based in Crawley, West Sussex. Tonight I'm joined by the amazing Lucy Latwing. Uh, we're really privileged uh, to have this series, In Conservation With series, sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. So thank you to them. So, hello Lucy, how are you? Let's not start off on mute, shall we? Hello everyone, um, thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about you. Yeah, uh, so my name's Lucy. Uh, my real name is not Lucy Latwing, I'm afraid to disappoint. It's uh, Lucy Hodson, but I go by Lucy Latwing on social media. Um, I am, well, I'm just generally an all-round nature nerd, nature lover, wildlife lover. Um, I do work in conservation. I currently work for the RSPB. Um, I also volunteer for the RSPB. I volunteer for a couple of other conservation organisations. And in my spare time, I basically yomp around the countryside, poking at all things living and gross and slimy and cool, um, take photos of it and then chat rubbish about it online. That's basically what I do. So um, my whole jam basically is about trying to um, attract more people to British wildlife, show people that we've got wildlife on our doorsteps and hopefully in the, the run of doing that, um, get people to take some action to protect it and save it. Because as I'm sure we all know, it's in, in rather a dire state. So yeah, it's a little that bit That sounds pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> yes, it is, I recommend it. <laughs> so tonight we're talking about the weird and wonderful wildlife of the UK. So first of all, um, how did you and when did you get into nature? Um, so I have, I'm sure like a lot of you, I've kind of always had it, the nature thing, whatever that might be. Um, I will defy anybody who says that any toddler that you find will automatically love nature and wildlife. You know, we've all seen those caricatures of toddlers trying to eat worms if you don't supervise them for 10 seconds in the garden. Um, kids aren't afraid of nature. They find it fascinating. They want to get their hands muddy. They want to see frogs. They want to see, you know, living things. Um, and quite often we lose that love along the way through it. Um, I don't know, kind of installation of fear or sanitization or anything like that. Um, I just had that fascination and kind of stuck with it as a kid. I was allowed to free roam and run around. So I was one of the only kids in the 90s when I grew up on my kind of in my village that was allowed to run around wherever I wanted. So it was just all outdoor entertainment, climbing trees, pond dipping, running through mud and fields and all sorts. And inevitably you encounter wildlife and fall in love with it. So. I've kind of always had it and that was a really long way of saying a short thing wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no not at all not at all. So um, did it help you get through lockdown because I know for myself um, I don't think I could have got through the various lockdowns we've had and the one now uh, without nature without sort of connecting with the wildlife out there did it help you at all? 100% yeah um, and I'll touch on a little bit in my talk in, in some time in my life where I've kind of relied on nature before to get me through a bit of a rubbish patch um, but for me it was kind of just business as usual and um, what I did find that was different in lockdown is that I became a lot closer to the wildlife directly on my doorstep because I couldn't travel to not that I ever go that far afield but you know I, where I'd normally drive to a local nature reserve I was now just walking from my front door for my daily exercise into the kind of the local green spaces near me um, and in areas that I thought were really quite um devoid of wildlife I was surprised to find quite a lot I don't know if anyone else had the same experience where um you know I've got a really rather gross scuzzy looking river at the end of my street that's often full of trolleys and coke cans and lots of annoying pieces of blue litter but I did find out that there are occasionally real kingfishers in there amongst the blue pieces of litter so um and when I say occasionally most times I go down there now I see it so yeah I saw a lot more wildlife than I expected to a lot closer to home which was really good well, I think I probably had the same sort of experience. I mean, I live in an urban town um, in Crawley and I mean, I've been to go into lots of local parks, um, walking from my house and I've just seen a lot more wildlife than I realised was here, like, especially in my garden, I like, backed onto a main road, uh, which is very noisy and very busy. And I've seen so much wildlife. I mean, buzzards, sparrow hawk. I saw a little egret in like the tiny bit of woodland behind my house which I was like on New Year's Day uh, I was so excited because I, I was like what there's a little egret and there's like a little stream going along this woodland and like yours it's like 
filled with like trolleys and like cans <laughs> and things. And I saw this little egret fly out and I was like, oh my God, wow. So <laughs> that made me pretty happy. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So would you like to tell us a bit more about the weird and wonderful wildlife of the UK? Of course, yeah. Um, let me open my presentation and we will get going. Brilliant. Wait for it. Drum roll. <laughs> Suspense. Oh, there we are. There we go. Can you see that? Yep, yeah, I can see that. Brill, right. Well, um, I'm basically going to tell you about some weird and wonderful wildlife, as the title says. Um, so just a little bit of kind of my story into delving into British nature um, and mostly the geeky, weird, gross, just bizarre and often horrific, but in a great way, um, amazing things about nature that perhaps aren't always the most obvious and sexy, but are the ones that I find um, the thing that kind of makes me fall in love with nature really. So um, all of this is wildlife with a British focus. So uh, this is me, I've just done a little introduction, so I won't go into too much, but um, I work in conservation um, for the RSPB, as I said. Um, my nature knowledge is pretty much self-taught um, in that I've not taken any formal courses to learn things. I've kind of just absorbed uh, knowledge. Um, I did go to uni, but I didn't really learn any wildlife identification. So um, all of my nature knowledge is, is very much self-taught and that means that I'm always learning and I have to get things wrong. Um, and I think there's, um, I think it's a good thing to be able to hold your hand up and say, I don't know everything and I do get things wrong. Um, I do a lot of blogging and vlogging and writing and campaigning online um, in all different types of formats. So whether it's filming myself to camera or whether it's writing stuff, um, it's all based around British wildlife. And I do that under the name of Lucy Letwing. And there's a photo of me with a snail on my nose. <laughs> Um, so this is how my Instagram started. So um, this is a print screen of my Instagram account back when I was a, I want to say 21 year old, I can't remember. Um, very typical 20, 21 year old Instagram account is all beers and parties and going on nights out and selfies and dogs. That's my little beloved dog, Jelly, there, my little white dog. Um, very, very standard. Um, and this is before I kind of really got into the nature thing. So it was just after uni, but I wasn't still a fully fledged wildlife nerd at this point. Um, and then this came along. <laughs> so um, this is a photo of me when I was 23 and I was diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which is one of the milder types of cancers. Um, it's not too bad. Uh, but at the time I had to have six months off work for chemotherapy um, and I, yeah, you can see it. I tried to do a mean impression of Voldemort. <laughs> Sorry, you know who, you who must not be named um, at the time. So um, at this point, it was just at the end of my first contract with the RSPB and I had a period of six months of treatment um, where I basically took the time out of, of working and doing anything. And during that time, I dedicated all of my spare time to running around outside, self-teaching myself wildlife. Um, my tactic was to basically find something living. If I didn't know what it was, take a photo of it and then sit at home and try and identify it later. And that, that rule applied to everything. So it was insects, birds, flowers, fungi, everything. Um, and from that, my kind of just fascination into lots of weird things grew. Um, and I slowly started to transform my Instagram into something that was a bit more um, nature focused. So this is more what my Instagram looks now, not so many um, nights out and selfies. Um, and it's a bit of a cross between photography and videos and vlogs and also delving into kind of the world of, of infographics um, and communication in that way as well. So um, it's very lighthearted, it's very fun, it's very silly. Um, and it's just trying to spread a little bit of kind of happiness and joy in wildlife and not always taking things too seriously, which I find that um, science community often can do. So um, speaking of, so science communication is kind of my um, interest that I fell into and it was more because I felt like I kind of straddled these two worlds in my early 20s in that I was, um, you know, seeing this natural world, I was meeting naturalists, I was working on nature reserves with volunteers who had buckets of information in their heads about, you know, birds and bird identification, bird song, the insects, there was like a whole mix of entomologists, some of them specialised in wasps, some in beetles, some in flies and you know, there's this massively detailed world that I was encountering as a young person and all of my peers and friends around me were just not interested. They were going shopping at the weekends, they were going on nights out, it was all just a very different life and, and me seeing 
how this scientific talk often just didn't appeal to people really got me thinking and that's where I kind of started trying to translate the work I did into kind of words and language that your average Joe when I'm you know drinking a pint down the pub I'm going to keep referring to beer quite a lot in this I think <laughs> I really miss the pub um but when I'm down at the pub and, and drinking over a pint something that I can you know translate the behavior of an animal or a sighting that I saw into something that gets somebody who knows nothing about it excited and interested um, so these are two definitions of what science communication is, but it's basically, the second one sums it up perfectly, the practice of communicating science-related topics to non-experts, um, and that can come in many forms. So why do science communication? Well, the average reading age of uh, an adult in the UK is that of a nine-year-old. So a lot of people tend to just talk in very, very advanced um, uh, language and, and use words that are perhaps, you know, it makes you sound smart, but the actual level of comprehension and understanding in a lot of people is much lower than that. And that's not a shameful thing, it's just a variation in, in our exposure to education, um, people's reading ability, literacy, it varies a lot. So why not pitch in a way that's more human? Because often you can find a uh, presentation of information is, is almost like putting on a front. It's, uh, it's not how you talk to, to a real person in real life. So that's what I'm kind of trying to do in, in my work. So when we talk about wildlife, and when I say wildlife, this is what people tend to think. So the big stuff, the sexy stuff, the stuff you see on your Attenborough documentary. So people will picture these animals that are massively charismatic, often megafauna, um, that's a big word, isn't it? Sorry, so large animals <laughs> um, that live across the world in far-flung countries, <clears throat> sorry, um, and the ones that you, know, you picture on the postcards that are stunning beautiful amazing amazing animals but we very very often do not think of the wildlife that is on our doorstep and should be on our doorstep which is two different things and um, so when we talk about british wildlife again the mind immediately drifts to beautiful but very charismatic very obvious often mammalian <laughs> um, animals so the larger stuff that um captures people's imaginations and i love every single one of these animals i think they're absolutely brilliant um, hedgehogs obviously we're, we're losing at a very very terrifying rate at the moment um, and we won't get into the politics around badgers but yes yeah, so when I talk to people and say I'm involved in conservation British wildlife this is what they tend to imagine that I'm talking about whereas for me the level of wildlife is on a different one so when I'm talking about wildlife I'm thinking of stuff like this so it is that nerdy stuff on the tiny detail stuff that's perhaps not obvious um, and the thing about all of these species that are photographed here, they're very, very varied from all different families and, and types of life. Um, but the behavior they exhibit, the way they interact with each other, the way they interact with the places they live um, and other species is the exact same behavior, if not more interesting and if not more complex than those massive, big, sexy animals that we talk about. Um, if you think of the stuff that's in a David Attenborough documentary, things like predation, so we're watching a lion hunting a zebra in the savannah or watching i don't know shoals of fish being chased by dolphins all of these things happen on a minute level right under our noses and it's often even more complex and wonderful and then there's things the big the big mammals and the big animals do um, and that's hopefully what i'm going to tell you a little bit about today so when i'm out in uh, in the field in nature i have a very very um slim line toolkit should we say so the, the three things i always take with me when i'm on a walk is my clip-on micro lens for my phone um this comes to the grand sum of about two pounds fifty on ebay and um, so if you can fork out for one of those i keep it clipped to um, my binocular strap as i go around brilliant little tool uh, my phone and my binoculars and that's basically all i take out um, now the whole point about this is that to be a nature nerd and to get out and to see these things, you really do not need all the kit. Um, what I do find about a lot of, of wildlife, um, kind of not photography, well, yeah, photography, um, and a lot of the wildlife world is um, a lot of it is taken, a lot of the photos that we see, a lot of the videos we see is taken on kit that is worth, you know, literally five grand, ten grand, more than most people will, will ever be able to save up to, to purchase. And it just makes, you know, those amazing shots seem less accessible and wildlife seems like something that a lot of people can't hope to see if you can't afford a lens as long as you're on on your camera for example 
So um, I've got some second-hand binoculars, a battle phone and a clip-on lens, and that's what I do pretty much all of my blogging with. I, I very rarely take a camera out, and the camera I do have is worth about 100 quid, if that. Um, it's probably worth a lot less because it's full of mud and scratches and things. <laughs> so this is what my toolkit means I end up looking like when I'm out in the field. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with these poses. This is a nature yoga, as I call it. <laughs> so this is kind of what I will end up doing inevitably on any walk is crouching down, climbing things. Um, the photo of me there with a the head in the log resulted in me breaking my glasses last week, which is really annoying. Um, but there was a very good slime mold in there, so it was kind of worth it. Um, but yeah, so I'll end up just looking like I'm an idiot. I'm sure many of you who are naturalists in the field are used to observing wildlife and, and having some poor passerby mistake you for um, being injured or um, being a little bit strange or perhaps being a little bit dodgy. <laughs> I've heard accusations of all three. Um, well, I'm sure you can imagine with photos like this. Um, but yeah, it's all about just getting really, really stuck in, um, getting down, getting up, getting whatever you want to do. Um, and that's where my kit kind of takes me. So you can see there, I've just got my phone and my binoculars in my hand most of the time. So I'm going to highlight some of my favorite species, and this is just a tiny few um, that I think exhibit some of the most mind-blowingly fascinating behavior um, that anybody can realistically see within a year in the UK. So this is stuff that if you keep an eye out and you're sharp and you pay attention, you'll be able to see it. Most people will be able to see it relatively close to home, I hope, she says. So first of all, I'm going to go for <laughs> the invertebrates. So anything that's kind of an animal that doesn't have a spine. Um, and these guys, like I said about that, the way the wildlife interacts, they can be social, highly. Um, they can be absolutely amazing parents, like incredible. And they can be deliciously devilish. So one of my favorite things about insects is just how, is badass the right word? Just how, um, not evil, because I don't want to taint them with that, but just gruesome but in a brilliant way like i really love the kind of amazing drama that unfolds in the insect world so that's what we're going to touch on so first of all meet the bobs so this is the black oil meat beetle um i'm going to try and say the latin name mellow proscarabeus um, and this is a gorgeous beetle so this is one of five species that we get in the uk of oil beetles um, and you can see there is black beetle chunky um, and it's got this gorgeous violet, purple, bluey iridescence. Um, so when the sun hits it, it just shines these gorgeous purple colours. Um, this is a female who I've called Bobolina. Um, and she is, I mean, you can see there she's got quite a booty on her. <laughs> um, and you can tell that it's the female because she's got quite um, relatively straight antennae when you compare it to the male who is Bob. So Bob and Bobolina. Bob's got quite kinked antennae and he's a little bit smaller than her. Um, now the story with these guys um, is that they are kleptoparasites and they've got one other gang of insects and a few different species that tend to be on their target list and that is these guys. So ashy mining bee and a number of other species of mining bee. Um, the, the oil beauties will basically do anything that they can to not have to um, feed and provision their own young. So the male and the female will mate, um, she will lay eggs, um, and from the eggs will hatch some tiny little juvenile beetles that have got one of the best names in nature, they're called triangulans, which sounds like something off a sci-fi film. Um, and these are tiny, tiny, tiny little creatures, and what, sh what they'll do is basically crawl towards any flower that they can see in sight, and they'll crawl up the stem and onto the head of the flower where they sit in waiting for a bee visitor. Um, and the front claws of these little tiny triangulants are adapted perfectly um, with little hooks on them. So when a bee lands on the flower, they latch onto the bee and the bee will then fly back. And if they're lucky enough to have latched onto a mining bee, such as the ashy mining bee, as we see here, they'll get carried back to that bee's um, nest. So the mining bee is in the name. They dig a hole to um, lay an egg in and then they'll uh, deposit a load of nectar and pollen, seal it up their egg will hatch, guzzle all the pollen, and then pupate and turn into an adult bee and emerge um, later the next year. But the oil beetle foils this plan in that the little triangle will disembark from its bee-shaped uh, taxi um, and crawl into the uh, mining bee's tunnel, eat the mining bee's egg, eat all the provisions, and then <laughs> pupate itself into a black oil beetle. So it's very, very sneaky. Um, it's, yeah, it's some kind of ninja stuff going on, but um, absolutely fascinating. And, you know, a lot of people will say, 
isn't that unfair on the bee? Isn't that, you know, aren't bees in trouble? Well, oil beetles are a lot more endangered than bees. And for me, the beauty in it is that relationship between the whole thing. If you've got an operating ecosystem, the fact you've got all these layers, the fact you've got enough pollen being produced by flowers to support enough bees to be able to support a parasite as badass as the black oil beetle shows that you've got a really healthy ecosystem. Um, so if you head to any kind of heathland area in the UK or you head to any kind of beachy footpath where there's meadows or anything like that, you could spot a black oil beetle. Um, there is, I believe, an online resource to record them with bug life, but if you just Google oil beetles, it should come up. So these are one of my favourites to start off with. Second are the footstep followers. Um, and this gang of insects is just one of the most fascinating of all. Again, it's quite morbid. I do apologize, but I find it fascinating. Um, can I say this? Dolichomitis. It's a Dolichomitis species of ichnoon wasp. And if you see that beast, I mean, you can see it there on my hand. Initially, it looks quite terrifying. <laughs> Um, but that thing on the tail end, so this is a female, and we know that because that thing on the tail end is not a stinger and it's not going to stab your eyes out and murder you. Um, that is actually an ovipositor. So only the females have them, and ovipositor, ovi means egg, positor means deposit, so it's an egg depositor. So what she basically shoots her eggs out of. And this is her in action. Just look at that pose. Um, I spotted this female um, a few months back this year, I think it was October. Um, and she was skulking along this fallen birch tree, um, sniffling it with her antenna like that, and then going to this pose. So I decided to try and um, oh, go back, try and film her in, in action. So hopefully you can see this. Um, you can see her antennae there. She's basically probing the surface of the bark, and you can see just in the foreground there's a very dark little spot, and that is a hole. So her antennae seem to have some sense in there where she can detect under the surface of the bark the larvae of a, bud, uh, a wood boring beetle. Um, and basically what she'll do is maneuver that needle thin ovipositor into that hole, into the grub and lay her eggs inside. And then her eggs will basically devour the grub and emerge as a wasp. Um, so once again, it's really morbid. It's parasitism in its finest, um, but it's absolutely fascinating. And the uh, the story behind the ovipositor itself is, is amazing in that you think something that thin um, and flimsy looking would be able to bore into wood, she can actually use it as a drill. And that's because the ovipositor is reinforced with different types of metals. So it's actually kind of like a little mini needle or sword, which is incredible. Um, but for her to be able to sense these kind of microscopic holes that I could barely pick up with my eyes and she was just going along and feeling all these different ones, it was absolutely amazing to see. Um, and then I did see, a little while later, a similar species. So this is another ichnemon. It's not Dolichomitis. I don't know which gang it is. Um, but this female, oh, this works. Doesn't sound down in case I'm talking. Um, she is laying her eggs into a napweed flower. And when I saw her doing this, I thought, I'm pretty sure that's an ichnemon wasp, and I'm pretty sure they don't lay their eggs in plants, and that's really weird to see. So I did some really in-depth Googling and found out that, again, she's got these kind of sensors where she can sniff out fly larvae that live inside the knapweed head. So a fly's come along and laid its egg inside the knapweed, and then she's come along, found the fly larvae, and laid her egg inside the fly. So it's a bit like the, there was an old lady who saw the fly, but even more gruesome, really. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, really, really cool to see. And so knapweed is a really, really common plant. You'll find it in scrubland, you'll find it in wasteland, you'll find it in your gardens, you'll find it in fields. And you can pretty much guarantee there's a couple of species of ignomans that will be around that patch doing exactly this. Um, so again, it's something really, really quite easy to see. Um, you'll also get ignomans that do this very famously with caterpillars. Um, particularly um, easy to see is the species that do it to um, Cinnabar moth caterpillars that you get on ragwort, which again is a plant that grows everywhere. A yellow, I don't want to use the weed word, but a yellow beautiful flower <laughs> that grows in lots of places. Um, and you do get ignorant wasps that stalk the caterpillars on there as well. So if you're looking for some drama and you know, you've know you got quite a strong stomach, then do go and have a look because it's, it's brilliant. So there's a few other ones here that I've just, I'm going to quickly summarize and not talk too much in depth in, but this is um, on, on first glance, you'd think a bumblebee, but this is actually a cuckoo species of bumblebee. Um, and rather like the cuckoo bird, this is a, a parasitic bee that's evolved to imitate the bumblebee 
um, whose nest she's going to break into. So she'll actually burst into a bumblebee nest and overthrow the queen, like some kind of Game of Thrones drama. Um, I've never watched Game of Thrones. I have no idea if any queen does that, but it sounds like it. Um, yeah, so she'll do that. Absolutely amazing, beautiful critter. Um, this is a sexton beetle. Um, so uh, it's one of the burying beetles. So these are some of the most social insects that we have here in the UK. Um, and the males and females will basically, um, when something dies, like a bird or a mouse or anything else, they'll come flocking in um, and males and males will fight males, females will fight ma females until a victorious male and a victorious female emerge from this amazing death battleground. And then they'll pair up, um, breed, and they'll both guard the babies and the eggs for quite a little while and just um, tear off little bits of dead animal and feed them. So it's really gross, but really cool and really cute. Uh, glowworms, um, Indy, you're listening. We've been and seen these in Sherwood Forest um, quite a lot. Glowworms are just amazing. So again, technically a beetle that can emit light out of its backside. What more is there to know? Um, if you go to any kind of mature woodland, um, well, not any kind of mature woodland, they're very specific sites, but glowworms are evenly spread throughout the country. So mature woodlands can host them um, and heathlands as well. So yeah, that's a good place for them to look. Uh, bee flies. <laughs> Isn't that just the cutest thing? Look how fluffy it is and it's got a really long nose. <laughs> oh, I love them. Um, bee flies are, again, not as innocent as they look. Um, they look like bees. They follow those same gang of mining bees around that the black oil beetle does. Um, the bee fly will wait for the, um, the mining bee to burrow a hole and then it will lay an egg, stick it to its foot and then flick it into the nest and try and like kind of basketball its own eggs into the bee's nest so that it hatches and eats the baby bees and, and the bee's food. So again, it's a parasite, a nest parasite, um, but an absolutely fascinating one. Um, now this might look like just a bit of gross cobweb, but if you look very closely, um, this in this photo you can see a dead drone fly, type of hoverfly and a dead wasp. And just above it, you might be able to see a little face peeping out. And that's the face of the tiniest spider. Talk about David and Goliath. <laughs> that spider has managed to tackle these beasts um, in its uh, web. And this is a very common spider that's spreading throughout the UK now. Very easily overlooked because it's tiny um, and green and it lives very often in ivy. So if you've got any ivy in your garden, check out for these little webs. Um, and you might find these fascinating spiders that can take on something, I don't know, 200 times its own size. Ridiculous. Um, and snails, the humble garden snail, have one of the most fascinating sex lives of any animal I've ever read about. Um, I can't see because I'm not seeing things, I'm having a bit to bear with me. There we go. Um, so circled here is something that is known as a love dart. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see that hard spike sticking out there. So these are two snails in the act of uh, reproducing. And the love dart is a calcareous uh, spike that is generated in the heat of the moment by a snail um, and they basically use them to stab each other um, in quite a gory and, and violent way but it's part of the uh, baby snail making process um, and the love darts uh, will help stimulate reproductive hormones from, from what I've read or something I don't know they're into it whatever they're into but yeah really cool to see so I found these um, in my garden this year one of which had a love dart which I'd never seen before so that's invertebrates. Now, what about the vertebrates? Now, I've stayed away from mammals. I'm just going to cover one vertebrate animal here that, that gets me kind of really excited. Um, it's not the newt, but I had a drawing of a newt. So, uh, the spine crew, the crew with the spines. So, my Christmas every year comes in March because March is toad breeding season and it is the best time of year. Um, so that this will be my fourth year if we're out of lockdown in time. But for the last three years, I have um, volunteered for the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust as um, a Toad Patrol volunteer. And I know quite a few other people have as well. Um, and this is basically a process where um, toads who are migratory, so um, they have historical breeding ponds or breeding rivers or breeding canals or insert other body of water here, that a population will return to again and again and again um, throughout their breeding life. And they only spend a short amount of time in water, um, which sounds quite unusual for amphibians, but the rest of the time they'll spend kind of on land, um, which is why they often have very dry skin. Um, and then they will hibernate away from their breeding grounds as well. So every spring, 
the march of the toads commences in the first couple of warm warmer evenings of of, um, of March, the month of March. Um, and at this time, as I'm sure you can imagine, there's roads everywhere in the UK, and quite often those uh, movements of toads now intersect with a very busy highway. Um, and as a result of that, you get a lot of toad pancakes if you've not got somebody like a toad patrol volunteer to intervene. So our job is basically to go out with a bucket um, and scoop these guys up. Um, so the toad crossing that I volunteer at has about 900 toads migrate annually. Um, and toads here, so you can see the ones on the right hand side, the one underneath is the female and the one on top is the male. Um, females are often significantly bigger than the males. Um, and they only start breeding um, perhaps at about two years old, but three to four years old, um, often five. So if you've got a lot of toads that get killed within the first couple of years, they won't have even kind of replenished themselves to breed yet. So it's really important that we can do what we can to, um, to basically help the numbers. Um, they're, they're just brilliant creatures to, just to watch. They're one of the most charismatic things I've ever seen. They're terrible. They've got the worst flight response ever. So if you've ever encountered a frog, you'll know it's like an explosion firework of energy. They're so hard to get your hands on. They're hopping all over the place. Toads kind of just look at you and then half arse really slowly crawl away. Um, that is they think because they've got a lot of toxins in their skin so there's only a few things that know how to eat a toad um, so toads kind of just rely on the fact that they taste disgusting um, and don't rely on hopping or, or running away so um, one of the things that does eat them I think is crows that have managed to figure out how to kind of split them from the inside out um, but yeah they're brilliant to watch um, at the moment um, when they first start moving it's mostly males and so when you get a bucket full of males they make this glorious squeaking noises which is one of the best noises i've ever heard um, and occasionally you'll get a male that mistakes your fingers for a female um, and he has these little pads on his hands <laughs> that are known as nuptial pads i do not know how something that small can be so strong i do not like i physically if they latch on you just cannot get them off i feel so sorry for those females <laughs> because you you know it's tiny but you just can't pry the little arms off you so you often just have to have you know a toad bracelet on until he decides to let go um so yeah we, we carry the toads in our bucket loads they head over to the water and um, they spawn so on the left here there's a nice comparison i found this year of the difference between frog and toad spawn so the frog spawns on the left the big globby stuff that we're already used to toad spawn looks like weird dotty ladders um it's like released in double rows um very neat very tidy very cool and hopefully the result of that spawn eventually will be one of these guys or several hundred or thousand of these guys. Um, tiny, 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 tiny toads. Um, and these will emerge from the, the ponds after a few months and then go and live a life in the woods. Um, and then hopefully come back a few years later when they're ready to breed. So, um, yeah, this is one of kind of the weird and wonderful things that, you know, when I say one of my favourite animals outside of kind of birds is a toad. <laughs> People look at me like I'm mad. But I'm, I mean, they're so ugly that they're beautiful, don't you think? And so grumpy looking, they just break my heart. I love them. So if you've never had a goat toe patrol, I implore you to give it a Google because it's just brilliant. It's so much better than sitting watching the telly. And we've all had enough telly this year. Um, right, if anybody does already follow me online, you'll know I have a bit of a fascination with fungi, um, freaky fungi. Um, it's something that I really love and I do enjoy giving it a good poke as well, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and these are some of my favourite fungi and favourite names. So one of my favourite things about fungi is just the exquisite, hilarious, wonderfully descriptive names that they come with. So this is purple jelly disc, which is so grotesque, but I mean, it's aptly named. Um, Scarlet elf cup, so it's bright red little cups that elves drink out of. Jelly ear, no explanation needed. Um, these are two parasols that were... Just fine specimens that I found earlier this year. Yellow brain, once again, no explanation needed. Um, this is the beef steak and it actually uses blood for added authenticity. Um, it's supposed to be edible, but it doesn't taste like beef steak. It just tastes like nothing and it's very chewy, but it looks cool, so just that. Um, the Amethyst Deceiver, which I think sounds like the best villain name out of some kind of fantasy novel. Um, these are beautiful and you'll find these ones under um, Beech trees, particularly in early autumn, and um, beautiful purple little mushrooms. <laughs> this is the stink horn, um, and its alternative name is Phallus impudicus, um, which basically translates as shameless member, let's just say. Um, and this is the bird of all, which 
which is a very fine specimen. You'll notice I like fine specimens of fungi that make interesting shapes. Um, and this is birch polypore that you'll find on lots of dead birch trees. Um, most of these, in fact, all of these aren't uncommon. All of these I found within, I reckon, a five mile radius of my home. Um, they're, they're all, none of these are like specialist fungi. These are ones that you'll generally be able to find in any kind of nature reserve or outdoor area, um, which is a great thing about fungi. Um, oh, my animation's messed up there. Okay, well, this is my Earth Star. Um, I don't know if you can see the video there at the side. Um, this is one of the most fascinating um, mushrooms that kind of has a life of its own. Um, you can't really see the photo behind there. I don't know what's happened, sorry. Um, but in the ones in the photo on my hand, you can see these kind of alien things. Now, I've not picked these mushrooms. I don't really pick them because I tend to just leave them in situ. Um, but the Earth Star is basically a glorified alien puffball. So that round bit on the top is a spore sack full of spores. Um, and the bit underneath is um, its legs. So it, it starts off as a ball and then it opens itself up into a star shape, um, hence it's called an Earth Star. And then those legs peel round and from underneath its, itself, lift itself up, detach itself from the soil. Um, and then as rain falls on it or as leaf litter falls on it or as an animal goes by and brushes it, um, you get that kind of motion of those spores being emitted out all over the forest. So um, absolutely amazing things to watch. That's one of my favorite fungi found this year. Um, now this is something I've gotten into this year, which is um, my uh, delving into the world of galls. So this is where the world of insects and plants interact. So each of these is, I mean, there's all different types of wonderful shapes that you can see in these photos, but every single one of these is a house of basically a baby insect. Um, so starting on the top left, we've got um, Robin's pincushion. And this is a gall that grows on um, rose bush and it's caused by a tiny wasp laying an egg in a rose bud and it kind of bushes out into this amazing red and yellow frizzy looking, well, pink cushion looking thing. Um, we've also got some little planet galls on some rows there at the top, the two little balls next to each other. Um, and then the other three on the oak leaves are um, different types of spangle galls. Um, so you've got smooth spangle, rough spangle and the uh, silk button gall on the right hand side there. Um, and every single one of these is caused by um, a tiny, 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 tiny species of wasp. Um, and so whether they lay their eggs in the leaf tissue themselves or in the vein of the leaf or in the bud, um, they basically, as well as laying an egg, inject um, hormone and chemicals that causes the plant to, to kind of distort um, and modify itself to create this shape that wraps around the eggs um, that will grow up inside and then emerge as adults. So, um, again, this is weird and wonderful nature on your doorstep. Um, every single one of these is found in the park at the end of my road, um, which is on an industrial estate. So um, none of it is kind of having to travel to far flung areas of nature to see. Um, and one of the most satisfying things is to walk up to a tree in kind of late summer and turn over a leaf and just see what yields underneath because so many of them are covered in gold. It's absolutely fascinating. So this is a story of when um, plants and insects collide. So the plant here is a sundew, it's a round leaved sundew. Um, and this is one of the few plants in the UK that is carnivorous. So when we talk about carnivorous plants, um, we tend to think of the Venus flytrap, the very famous one. And um, this one I think is somehow even cooler than that because although it doesn't move, um, it uses this really enticing method to draw in um, insects. So sundews grow in kind of acidic bog habitat. And if you know anything about acidic bog habitat, you'll know that um, there's a very, very low amount of nutrients in the soil. So the plant is really struggling to get nutrients. Um, so it has to come up with some genius way of getting nutrients from somewhere else. And to do that, it's turned to eating insects. So um, those little red hairs that are coming off the leaves there, you can see on the end, there's those little um, like droplets. And those are actually really, really sticky. So they're full of like a sweet substance. It's like a little sugar trap. And so obviously, you know, flies can't resist sugar. They come hopping on in. And before you know it, they're stuck um, and the plant will basically draw them in and kill it. So in this video here, <laughs> I feel really mean, but at the same time, I love sundew. So <clears throat> you can see here that fly is stuck. Um, and on the left hand side of the fly, um, there's actually the partially digested remains of another insect that fell into the trap as well. So um, if you go to any kind of bog, boggy little patch, anywhere where you get... Um, 
you know, sphagnum moss or anything like that, then there is a good chance that you could find um, some sundews, which, you know, fascinating things to see. You do also get um, another type of um, carnivorous plant called the butterwort, butterwort, I don't know how to say it, um, but that tends to be more mountainous areas that you'd see that. Um, sundew are quite a realistic one to see. Oh, there's the title, better late than never. Um, and this is one of my most kind of um, really nerdy things that I could just spend hours doing. Um, the wonderful world of leaf miners. Um, now this is nature's pure art form. It's kind of like calligraphy meets, autographs meets, just, I don't know, batik. It's just beautiful. Um, and leaf mines are the patterns left behind by a gang of insects. It can be different types. So it can be flies, it can be saw flies, it can be wasps or it can be moths. Very, very often moths and both of these are moth species here. And this is a tiny, tiny, tiny type of moth, one you'd barely notice, only about four or five millimeters long. Um, both of these are. And um, they have, each species of the moth has its own very specific species of plant. Um, and they'll basically track that down and they'll lay their egg on the surface underneath and that'll hatch into a caterpillar which will burrow into the leaf and live a life in between the membranes of that leaf. So it's such a small caterpillar, it lives inside a leaf. Um, and you can actually see the story here of, of the hungry caterpillar, the kid's book, where it starts off absolutely tiny. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it starts off tiny in that one on the left. And then as it guzzles its way through, it basically gets fatter and fatter, works its way to the end, um, and then bursts out and emerges as an adult. Um, if you hold them up to the light, you can see um, this little green patch here. Um, you can also see underneath as well, the blacker bits are literally caterpillar poo, that is frass. Um, so you can see lots of caterpillar poo in there. But the green bits are known as green islands. And there's actually um, an explanation behind these green bits that was only found within the last few years um, by some entomologists. Um, and so that, that area is basically a deliberate strategy of the caterpillars to delay the onset of autumn. So when it's getting to late summer, early autumn, and the caterpillars are still munching away, they're thinking, oh God, I'm running out of time. I still need to eat. I'm not ready to grow up yet. Um, and so they actually have a, cat um, a bacteria that lives inside the caterpillar that um, as the caterpillar is eaten and it secretes in its saliva, this hormone that the bacteria helps it produce. Um, and that hormone is, is a, a thing, if you're getting really geeky, called a cytokinin um, or a mix of cytokinins. But that hormone basically is the thing that stops plant tissue from turning that brown color. So it keeps it photosynthesizing and keeps it green. So um, they basically evolved this uh, relationship between the bacteria and the caterpillar where they benefit each other. The bacteria gets a nice warm place to stay and it gets food that the caterpillar eats. Um, and in return, it releases these hormones that the caterpillar sends out and basically just perpetuates its own food source. Um, so holding these up to the light can be absolutely fascinating. So you can see there on the right, that is the caterpillar. It's a tiny caterpillar um, in that oak leaf still munching away. And this was, I think this was early October. So definitely very much in autumn, <laughs> it's still clinging on. Um, and this, again, you can get this in your back garden, like the park down the road, anywhere you want, um, you will get leaf miners in leaves. Um, it's brilliant to see. The variety of them can be like an art project. So this is where I can just lose myself for hours and just seeing how many different colour forms and shapes and sizes and, and stuff you can find. Um, this is one of my favourites. So if you find any standard beech, which you often get in like quite ornamental gardens, um, this is Stigmella titriella, I think. The Stigmella moths, they're a gang, uh, there's loads of different species of stigmella moths and each stigmella has its own plant but they have that kind of iconic scribble like signature so it really looks like somebody had written on the plant absolutely beautiful so uh to round off because <laughs> i've just chatted loads of rubbish at you uh the rules for me of being an nature nerd are stay curious so never stop looking for stuff you know i can make now any place or any time interesting if there's an opportunity to look at nature if even if i'm at a bus stop there's cobwebs at bus stops and in cobwebs you get the spiders like there's nature everywhere you go um so you know wherever you are if you need some entertainment just have a look around you because it's when you look in nooks and crannies and tiny places and unexpected places lift up a rock just look behind that leaf mm -hmm. you often find something like oh my god i can't believe that's here um that's what happened with the snails with the love darts this year i looked under a plant pot and was like oh my god so um, yeah, look for the tiny stuff. Um, so just think outside the box. Um, the tiny worlds of things like this year, 
I just, in my park down the end of the road, it's all mown grass. And then there was one tiny little block of wood and I lifted this tiny little block of wood up in the middle of this lawn. And underneath it was a nest of earwigs with little baby earwigs. Oh, just so cute. So look for the tiny stuff. Um, fight the fear. And this is the thing that I would advocate to anyone. So I'm very aware of some of the stuff I've spoken about tonight would be massively fear inducing to a lot of people. Um, and I'll hold my hands up. There are things that I'm not particularly keen on. Um, horse flies for one can absolutely do one. I hate them. But when you start learning about nature and when you start Oh, I think her Wi-Fi has gone. <laughs> but we'll wait on a few minutes to see. Hopefully it'll reconnect. Wait a few minutes. <laughs> I think her Wi-Fi has gone. Am I here? Yeah, you're back, you're back. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened then. Can you hear me <laughs> Froze. <now>? Froze. <laughs> <laughs> Is it back now? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Well, I'm very nearly finished, so I'll shut up in a sec. Um, last rule, have fun. That's it. Um, and then this is just a little video of a bee that I fed a flower this year to finish off with because um, I put this on Twitter and before I knew it, I had two and a half million views and it was in the Hindu Daily Express <laughs> and traveling around the world. Um, this is just a bee in my back garden that I offered, offered a lavender flower and surprisingly it drank from it. A little red-tailed bumblebee and it was one of the best moments of 2020 so oh, that's it thank you very much that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much well that was just so fascinating i learned so much i mean it did. i think it should be shown to everyone um <laughs> everyone all around the world because i mean i think everyone would be fascinated by nature uh, if they saw that so thank you thank you again all right thank you I know you mentioned about uh, slime moulds. Um, would you have to explain a bit about what they are? Yes, um, I was going to put them in and then I thought, no, Lucy, it's too far because they all look like <laughs> dog vomit and sick. <laughs> um, slime moulds are not a fungus. They're not an animal. They're not on anything. They're in their own kind of sub kingdom and nobody really knows where they belong. They're semi kind of like fungi in some ways. Um, they live most of their time as microscopic individual organisms that we can't see um, so they'll be all over the place and then when time comes that food for them so they, they they're like detritivores and they eat all sorts of rubbish but when food becomes short they amalgamate into a super organism which takes the form of a slime and these can be like fluorescent yellow or bright powdery metallic blue or i don't know they, all sorts of shapes um, and they can move, they can walk up, not, not walk, but they can uh, slime their way towards a new food source. <laughs> Maneuver <thing>. themselves. <laughs> um, and then they mature into different stages where they'll then start emit emitting the equivalent of kind of like a fungi spores in order to reproduce. It's a lot more complicated than I can understand and I've got a massive hole in my knowledge, but there's some very common species that you can find. One of them's called the false puffball. Um, and lots of people send it to me thinking it's a, a fungi and it's it's not, it's a slime mold. It looks like um it kind of looks like a truffle out of a chocolate box that's like white chocolate and then when you crack the shell it's got like powdery chocolate inside but definitely don't eat it <laughs> um, that's a very common one and another one is coral slime mold as well it's like little white corals beautiful mm. yeah well that sounds pretty cool i mean i haven't seen one yet but i know i've seen a lot of social media people uh, sort of yeah they look pretty pretty weird <laughs> it's a great group on facebook time. really really good facebook group where people share photos of them called like oh, slime well, i'll have a look <laughs> I mean, I have seen a few of the, the fungi species that um, that you mentioned. I mean, the yellow brain, I saw that uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and I was so excited to find it because it was just on a stick in the middle of the path. I was like, wow, it was meant to be. It was right yes. there. <laughs> yeah, and that's I mean, a really interesting one in that it's, it's parasitic, so it looks like it's growing on wood, but it's actually eating another fungus underneath. So yellow brain is like a, it's kind of like a zombie fungus. It'll eat another fungi that's eating dead wood really cool wow well i didn't know that either <laughs> so like how obviously fungi is quite a big subject to learn but what would you say to someone that wants to get into say for example fungi um do not pressure yourself whatsoever um i know nothing about fungi like i reckon i could i reckon i could roughly name like a hundred species and there's fifteen thousand in the uk 
so I am not a mycologist. Um, yeah. It is an extremely intense, in-depth art form, I would say, to be able to identify all the fungi. Um, you can quite quickly get to grips with kind of like groups of, you know, um, there's loads of brown ones that all look the same, no clue what they are, but you know, the very iconic ones that you'll bump into a lot, you can quite quickly learn. Um, there's some great resources online as well, and there's some good books. So I've got the Collins Fungi Guide, and that's really good. Um, yeah, so I'd say just don't pressure yourself at all, because if you really want to get into it, you're going to have to buy a microscope and start, like, dissecting mm. pores and all sorts of stuff. I know. I mean, I, I've got a few friends. I mean, a young mycologist uh, group, and I mean, yeah, <laughs> got all the microscopes and things, but I haven't gone that far yet. I might do not saying I won't <laughs> I find them pretty fascinating yeah it is it's really interesting so apart from um that I know you're an ambassador for the Beaver Trust aren't you yes yeah um so Beaver Trust are an excellent uh, very new charity actually um they only kind of started in the last year and a bit and their mission is to kind of work with all sides on the big beaver debate so um for anybody who doesn't know, we're kind of in the process of reintroducing, reintroducing beavers across the UK in various different ways. Um, some of them have been controlled trials, some of them have been mystery beavers that have turned up, um, some of them are still very much um, locked in small enclosures as like a little test thing. Um, and so the Beaver Trust is working with, you know, enthusiastic landowners and organisations who want to bring back beavers, um, and they're also working with um, people who might have concerns at bringing back the beavers, rightly so, in a lot of places, you know, it's quite a sensitive thing. So um, where beavers might do things such as impact on water levels, um, they'll be working with people in the local area to, to kind of manage all of that. Um, and yeah, they've just done some brilliant work in kind of raising the awareness of the amazing ecological impact of beavers because they're just excellent creatures. Not a lot of creatures have that much of an impact in an area when you put them in. Um, you know, if you think of other charismatic mammals that we might bring back to areas in England, so things like pine martins or, heaven forbid, lynx or anything like that, they won't have as big of an impact as a beaver because of the beaver's tendency to just obsessively dam up any floating water and to chop down trees, which isn't always a bad thing. You know, the way that beavers do it, it creates dead wood, it creates habitat, but just their daily activities create so much space for more life. Um, for insect life and for bird life and for everything in between it just helps rejuvenate the land so um yeah i'm all for beavers beavers are great yeah me too i totally agree i mean they're just amazing aren't they yeah oh, I'd, I'd love to see one one day yeah. hopefully soon <laughs> they're big and they smell and it's great oh i didn't know that <laughs> keep away keep a bit of a distance <laughs> so i know you also um i saw that you were uh, working on bbc spring watch last year so what sort of things were involved with doing that Yes, yeah, so that was a dream come true, really. I mean, since I was a nerdy teenager, I've absolutely loved uh, the Watch series. Um, so obviously, there was a bit of a spanner in the works with, with COVID. Spring Watch is on in the middle of lockdown. So I just did some behind the scenes stuff, um, helping operate their um, live cameras remotely. So I had like a big setup in my dining room <laughs> with loads of screens and stuff. And yeah, it was 4 a.m. till 4 p.m. shifts and just watching obsessively live nests to make sure I didn't miss any drama. Um, it's really cool. So it's got to see lots of stuff ledge live and had some drama when the mum, the mum black cap died really like dramatically on the mm, nest. I remember that. Shakespearean. She was like, oh. mm. <laughs> and then the baby's just like kept crawling on her body. It was weird. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. It was uh, <laughs> quite dramatic. <laughs> bad enough. We just sat down and we were like, black cap's not moved for two hours now. Mm, yeah. yeah, a bit. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so wow. That's uh, pretty amazing. Mm. I'd love to be able to watch all them cameras all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah, fascinating yeah. to see all the all what they're up to. Very therapeutic, yeah. <laughs> yes. So um I know obviously both of our sort of missions is to try and engage with the wider public and other people with nature, but I know it is so difficult and uh, to try and engage with sort of the wider public. Obviously, we can talk to the converted, they're into nature already, but the whole sort of mission is to get more people. Uh, into wildlife so do you think media and sort of tv are doing enough to try and get more people um, interested um i think there's some really good work going on i think things like what the watchers do um and a few of the programs um have tackled some really good subjects and are doing a really good job at communicating it to perhaps a non-wildlifey audience 
Um, but I do, on the flip side, think the media is an absolute hellish place for hysteria and um, scaremongering and just ill-informed nonsense when it comes to wildlife. Um, I did a lot of research around like some headlines earlier this year, and it's just hilarious. Like, not exaggerating, headlines like um, "sex crazed giant spiders invading invading British homes." Um, mm -hmm giant Asian murder hornets like flocking to the UK. Um, <laughs> so ridiculous. Um, a seagull ate my chihuahua. Um, oh, really all this kind of stuff. Like it's just like, it just stokes fear. And like, you know, I'm sure many of you guys want, you know, when, when you're known in your social circles as the wildlife one, people come to you with all sorts of things. Like sometimes they're knocking on the door with like a baby bird in a box. But you get asked questions all the time and, I've got quite a few friends who are parents now and they message me things like, they just share me these articles on Facebook that are like hysterical about um, spider bites. None of them are spider bites. They're not, you know, it's, it's an infection from something else. Spiders don't bite like that in the UK, but somebody's assumed it is. And then before you know it, it's in the Daily Mail and it's just, you know, it's just snowballing. And so it's really upsetting trying to kind of fight that because it sells and it gets clicks. People want the horror and they're like, oh my God. Um, and so I've got friends who are petrified of wasps, who are absolutely terrified of these oak processionary moth caterpillars that cause rashes, because one little boy had a really bad allergic reaction, and of course the photos were all over the media, and next thing you know, everyone's saying that we should like get flamethrowers to all the caterpillars that we see, and it's just, yeah. So I think there's a lot more the media could do to be mm. much more sensible about it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's always the bad news stories that get the most press, which I think is just so, so annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think that sort of rounds off the main section uh, of today's talk. I do have a few final questions for you, though. Mm -hmm. So what is your favourite bird? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, my, my, I cheat. I have a joint favourite. Um, I have two. It is the swift, because nobody can resist a swift. And the dipper, I absolutely oh. love the dipper. It's, it sings and it flies underwater. Like, can't be that a great. No, I've not seen one yet. I've not seen a dipper yet. <gasps> oh, I know. It's, I know. it's on my list. Stream. They're just I'd love stunning. to. <laughs> really good. Uh, and another question: If I gave you one million pound, what would you spend it on? I didn't know you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I would buy some land and rewild it. Brilliant. And depending on how much the land was, I would buy a TV advert and be like, what, what are you all doing? Why are you all buying stuff you don't need? And why are you all spraying pesticides in your garden and buying plastic lawn? Please save the wildlife. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. And my <laughs> last, very last final question. If you could create a species of any, any animal, what would it be? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'd say that there is, I would say, here's a clever answer. There are so many species in the world, so many life forms, past or present, that anything that I could imagine has probably already happened in some form because nature is just absolutely ridiculous. So I don't know if there is a point in me trying to make something up. <laughs> something that eats plastic lawns. There we go. Oh, that is a good idea. That's <laughs> I don't like plastic lawns. So <laughs> Me <know> neither. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you, Lucy, for joining us. It's been absolutely amazing having you on. Thank and you thanks so me. much uh, to the audience for joining us tonight. It's been amazing to see you all. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.